Good evening, and welcome. I'm going to start with a question, so pay attention. We'll need you to think carefully. How many of you in the room have thought about writing a book? How many people? No, have th no hand up higher. Don't be pathetic. <laughs> thought about writing. Uh, nearly 90%, 80-90%. How many people have written a book? One, two, three, ah, we're still doing well. Three, four, ah, you've already written one, good. And how many people have been published? I know you have, sir. <laughs> good, good. The facts are very frightening. For every 10,000 books published, sorry, for every 10,000 books sent to a publisher, one is published. For every 10,000 books published, one gets on the bestsellers list. For every 10,000 books that get onto the bestsellers list, one gets to number one. That's how tough it is. It's no different, as I was explaining upstairs, it's no different if you want to be a ballet dancer, if you want to be an opera singer, or you want to run in the Olympics. There's a hundred thousand people trying to do what you do. That doesn't mean there isn't someone in this room who will do just that, who will dominate the bestsellers list around the world. But you have to understand that you're up against everyone else. And it's tough. And I began my life, I, I, when, I, when I left Oxford, I wanted to be a politician. And I, um, at the age of 26, got onto the Greater London Council as, it, as its baby member. And after that, three years later, I was in the House of Commons at the age of 29 as a member of Parliament. And then I had five very happy years in the House of Commons, and I made a very foolish investment. The younger ones can learn from this. I made a very foolish investment in a company called Aquablast, where I not only invested every penny I had because the Bank of Boston told me my shares would double, uh, but I borrowed money as well. Very foolish indeed. And I lost £400,000 in three weeks and was facing bankruptcy. And I uh, couldn't get a job. Left the House of Commons, couldn't get a job. It's hard enough getting a job as an ex-MP, as a few people will be finding out this week, but it's even more difficult if you're 400,000 pounds in debt facing bankruptcy. So I sat down and wrote my first book, Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less, and 17 publishers turned it down. The 18th publisher agreed to give me 3,000 pounds and publish it. Jonathan Cape, 3,000 pounds. Now, if you've been half awake, you'll remember the 400,000. <laughs> and you'll realize that 3,000 is not actually a big bite if you're also trying to eat and drink and live. And it sold in the first year. I've read many times it was one of the world's instant bestsellers. It was not. It sold 3,000 copies only worldwide. And uh, so I cleared my debt of £3,000. It then went into paperback, and they published, uh, uh, Pan published 25,000 copies, and they sold them in a month. So I rang them up and said, are you going to publish another 25,000? And they said, no, no, it doesn't work like that, Jeffrey. You write another book. We'll see how that does, and then maybe we'll go to 5,000 for the hardback, and maybe we'll go to 30. No, I said, you've just sold 25,000 in a month. Publish another 25,000. No, no, they said, yes, yes, I said. No, no, they said, yes, yes, I said. And they published another 25,000, and they sold them in a month. So I rang them back up again and said, are you going to publish another 25? No, no. They said, yes, yes. I said, no, no. Yes, yes. I said, and they published another 25,000. And they sold them in a month. They've now sold 27 million 
775,000, and I still have to ring them every single month. <laughs> Second book was called Shall We Tell the President and crept into the bestsellers list both here in the United States. And then I sat down and wrote a book that literally changed my whole life called Cain and Abel. And actually life has never been the same since. It sold a... Uh, no, we'll come to that in a moment. And, and when, the, when the American, my agent, who's an American, lives in London, married to David Owen, Debbie Owen, in those days, and she said, I'm not going to sell this book, Geoffrey, I'm going to auction it. And I said, what does that mean, Debbie? She said, well, I'm going to send it to uh, 23 houses in the United States and ask them to bid, and the highest bidder gets it. And she sold it, uh, and we're talking 40 years ago, she sold it for 3,200,000. Again, one or two of you who have been paying attention will be able to take 400,000 away from 3,200,000 and see that I bought a totally new meaning to the words nouveau riche. <laughs> so, they had a problem in the United States. No one had ever heard of me. And they said, what we've got to do, Jeffrey, is we've got to get you on Good Morning America, because then you'll hit 45 million people in one go, and that'll give us a chance to get on the bestsellers list. And then they explained to me the importance, the significance of the bestsellers list. In the New York Times, they have a top 15. If you get into it, they heart, you're late. Come and have a seat, you're late. Oh, come and have a nice seat up here. Don't stay back there. Come on. Come on. Come on. You're going to lose the final, by the way, but don't let it worry you. England are going to win the final. India will be there probably, but India, forget it. Hi, good to see you. Good of you to come, really. Where was I? Well, now, they explained to me the importance of the... Sit down. They explained to me the importance of the bestsellers list. If you get in the top 15, they half the price of the book. And you go on a special shelf in every bookshop in America with top 15 New York Times. Well, you can imagine how many books you sell if you're on that list, top New York Times bestsellers list, and you're unknown. So they said, Jeffrey, we've got to get in that list. And you've only got three weeks. I said, what do you mean you've only got three weeks? If you don't get in that list in three weeks, they send the books back. That's it. You've got a three-week window. Right, I said. And we're going to try and get you on Good Morning America because that's the big breakthrough. That's the big chance. So they rang me up and they said, you know, it's not easy. Fiction is not easy for the bestsellers list. Non-fiction. If you were to write a book on better sex, we'd get you on just like that. If you could write a book on how to cure cancer, We'll get you on, just like that. If you can write a book on how to lose half a stone in a week, we'll get you on, just like that. But fiction, they're very, well, one of very... And then they rang with a week to go and said, we're on. You're on. Good morning, America. And listen carefully, Jeffrey. You've got two minutes. It's a six-minute slot from 7.23 to 729 and you're sharing it with two other people. You're with Billy Carter, the brother of the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, and he is pushing Billy's beer. After Billy's beer and Billy Carter comes Mickey Mouse. Now Mickey Mouse is celebrating the 75th year of Walt Disney. And then you and you've only got two minutes. Think of it as 120 seconds. And you must say Cain and Abel as often as you possibly can. Because no one's heard of you, so we've got to get the name of the book over. Got it, I, got it, I said. Got it. I'm your man. I'm a natural communicator. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, and we're going to fly you over on this new airplane called the Concorde. You're going to stay at the Plaza Hotel in the presidential suite. Everybody will know this is the biggest book of the year. 
so fine, they kept their word. They flew me over on Concord. I was driven in this car about the length of this room up to the Plaza Hotel. I had the presidential suite. I was told I would be on the next day. There I would be on, and I'd got two minutes. I went to bed. Of course, I couldn't sleep. Put my best suit on, marvelous shirt, tie my wife had chosen. I was ready. And they took me in this, another of these limousines, down to ABC, and I was taken to the green room. And there in the green room was Mickey Mouse and Billy Carter. And we're all shaking. We're all a bit nervous. We're all a bit worried. We've got two minutes. It's our big chance. So 7.23, up goes Billy Carter. He was good, by the way. He promoted Billy's beer very well indeed. Trouble was he took two minutes and 11 seconds. So I'd lost 11 seconds already. On goes Mickey Mouse. Now I have to tell you about Mickey. Mickey was a pro. Mickey taught me something I've remembered for 40 years when you go on television. If you know it's the last question, just go on talking. And Mickey just went on talking and he did two minutes and 31 seconds. I am now in real trouble. I am nervous. I am heading up. I am sitting in front of the man. The red light is on. No one can speak. The red we're going to go on. I sit down in front of Dave Hartman, the biggest interviewer in America on morning television. And there in front of him is a copy of Cain and Abel. And just looking at it, it was clear it had never even been opened, let alone read. And he is quickly reading notes about me. He's not read the book, and he doesn't even know who I am. And I've got about 86 seconds. So he looks in front of me and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome to the studio Jeff Archer. Not a good start. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Good evening, David. Or good morning, David. And he said, uh, looking at the notes very quickly, he looks at me and goes, I hear you came over on the Concord. I said, this is right. This is an airplane that flies twice the height of any airplane on Earth. This is an airplane that goes twice the speed of any airplane on Earth. You can have breakfast in London. You can get on the plane. You can land in New York and you can have breakfast again. This is an achievement of modern engineering that any nation on Earth would be proud of. And I'm proud to stay and stand here and say I'm an Englishman and we built it. And Mr. Hartman said, it's been lovely having you on the show. <laughs> My publishers were not pleased. <laughs> when the bestsellers list came out the next week, I was number 43. With two weeks to go. And they're cross with me. Because I didn't mention Cain and Abel once. <laughs> Don't worry, Jeffrey. We're going to send you to Chicago. Where you will be interviewed by the great Milt Shulman. And this time you'll have the six minutes to yourself. It's a radio show that goes out to 11 million people. Don't miss the opportunity to say Cain and Abel as often as you can. So I fly down to Chicago. What I didn't realize, the great Nobel Prize winner, the great Milt Shulman, economist, Nobel Prize winner, this is his hobby, is interviewing writers. And he's sitting there and he has a theory. We became close friends over the years, but I'd never met him. His theory is, don't talk to the author before he walks into the studio. It loses the spontaneity of the whole thing. Fine. So in I go, and I sit down opposite the great professor, and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I have in the studio with me this evening a legend. I have in the studio with me this evening a man I have wanted to meet all my life. <laughs> Will you welcome to the studio the conqueror of Everest, Sir Edmund Hillary? <laughs> and then he said, but before he comes... <laughs> We hit number 31 the following week. <laughs> the publishers are now not going to send me back on Concord. It's a complete disaster. They're not selling any books at all. 
And I've now arrived after a 17 city tour, which is what you did in those days. Don't do that any longer. In Los Angeles. And a phone call comes through from my publishers in New York saying, please, Jeffrey, we've got you on one more show. Please, Jeffrey. Please, Jeffrey, could you mention Cain and Abel? <laughs> please, Jeffrey. I go on the show and there's a very elegant, gray-haired gentleman sitting in front of me on America's biggest show. And I am trying to compose a first sentence when he says, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome my guest this evening, Jeffrey Archer. I picked up his book, Cain and Abel, three days ago. I could not put it down. It's arguably the best novel I've read in the last 20 years. He then held it up. I want every one of you to go out and buy it. <laughs> it was number one on the New York Times the following week. I'd just like to thank Mr. Johnny Carson for his kindness on that particular occasion because it literally changed my whole life. Since then, I've written uh, 20 books. And more recently, at the age of 70, which none of you in this room, except perhaps you at the back, sir, none of you in this room could even begin to understand. But at the age, but you'll get there, I promise you, and then you'll understand it. <laughs> the age of 70, well done, sir. Well, there's two of you, <laughs> two of you. The age of 70, I made a decision, I've got to keep myself going. I can't afford to stop. I've got this remarkable wife who works even harder than I do and whose achievements are far greater than mine. I've got, to, I've got to keep going. I can't become a vegetable. So I said, I went to my publisher and said, I'm going to write, this is how it began. I'm going to write five, oh, you're still here. How nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write five books in a row called The Clifton Chronicles, the story of Harry Clifton and Emma Clifton and Giles Barrington and their life. And it'll keep me going to 75. The problem was I'd written the five books by the age of 75, and Harry was only 42, and Giles was only 41, and Emma was only 39, so I couldn't kill them all off in book five. So I went back to the publisher and said it's going to be seven books. And they said that's fine, and we're at seven books, to the age of 77. So I've written seven books in seven years. It really drove me. It really gave me a purpose. Of course, I was naturally worried I might die at 75, in which case there were, at that point, 40 or 50 million fans waiting for book six, and I'd be dead. So I kept having to say, please, <laughs> please, can I do the seven books? And by the way, could I do a few more now that I've got through? <laughs> so I did the seven books, and that was much more, which, at an audience like this, I don't mean this at all, really, an audience like this, how could you begin to understand how a man or woman of 70 suddenly makes the decision they're blooming well going to work harder than they've ever worked in their life before. So that is done. I've got a set of short stories coming out. I love doing short stories. I get them from all over the world. I've got a set of short stories coming out in uh, October, and then I'm going to set out on uh, probably the biggest single individual book I've done since Cain and Abel. And uh, I've done 12 drafts of it so far. And saying 12 drafts, brings me on to hard work, because there'll be one or two layabouts in this room who think they can knock up a novel at the weekend, and it'll be top of the New York Times bestsellers list a week after that, and they can retire and do nothing for the rest of their life. Not like that. So, uh, I just want to tell you about the process of writing. Listen carefully, children. I rise at six o'clock every morning and write from six until eight. Handwritten every word. I don't know how to use machinery. I have a break for two hours and I work from 10 until 12. Then I have an hour's walk and a light lunch and I'm back at 2. And I work from 2 until 4. A break in the afternoon for two hours and I'm back at 6 when I read what I've done that day from 6 until 8. I have a light supper, I'll be in bed by 9.30 at 10, up again at 5.30 the next day. First draft, usually 51, 52, 53 days, usually about 300 hours. What I've just come back from Mallorca after the 12th draft of the latest book, 
and I'll probably send it to the publisher after 14 drafts. If you write a book, if you say to me, Jeffrey, I've written a book, most people mean they've written the first draft. I wish it was that easy. I wish it got easier. Of course I'm more professional. Of course I'm a better craftsman. But there is still no shortcut to actually delivering a book that millions of people want to read. No shortcut. I wish there was. I'd take it if there was. I'm working just as hard now as I've ever worked in my life. So that's the process. It then goes to the publisher. And roughly six to eight months later, it's on the bookshelves. And I take, I'll tell you something that happened this morning, and therefore only applies to this talk. I've got a set of short stories, and they've got too few lines a page. They've got 27 lines a page, and I said I wanted 33. I rang them up. They said they'd forgotten, and they apologized. <coughs> and when I get back tonight, they're going to show me how, what, 33? On, on Clifton Chronicles, it's about 38. But on short stories, I like it a little bit less to get the speed of the whole thick process. And they did 28, and I said, no, I want 30. So I care about the cover. I care about the print. I care about the paper. If the book fails, it has to be my fault. I don't want to be able to say, well, really, they did a very bad job. I don't want to say that. I want to say it's my fault. So I care about every single aspect of producing the book. Why? Because I want to be read. I haven't needed the money since Cain and Abel, but I want to be read. I am in that way a professional. I care. I want all of you and millions of others to read my books. And if you think I'm a competitor, you're right. I look at myself against every other of my rivals. I get up in the morning, I put my feet on the ground, and I look up at the heavens at six o'clock and say, are you still in bed, John Grisham? Because <laughs> I'm up and working. And I intend to go on writing. I've had a very privileged and wonderful life and always wonder when the good Lord will stop allowing me to pick up a pen and deliver the next sentence. And I was saying to one of the young ladies tonight, it's a privileged life. But then you in this room understand privilege. You're among a handful of people who've been allowed to go to one of the greatest universities on earth. You're among a handful of people who have a better chance of success than 99.99999% of the world. And if you don't understand that, you'll be fools for the rest of your life. What I love about Oxford, I live in Cambridge because of my wife. What I love about Oxford and Cambridge is that almost every human being I meet understands what a great privilege that is. I had the honor of being at this university, and there isn't a day goes by when I think it is other than an honor. Thank you. You hadn't thought of opening one of the bottles, worm, and <laughs> pouring it into one of the glasses, worm. What are you, just a, a redundant chairman, are you? What's the point of you? And don't bother with the bloody questions. I'll do them myself. You can go, sack. It's fine. I finished in a few uh, days shush. anyway. Yeah. Who think, hands up, who thinks he should have the sack? Didn't even open the bottle and pour the water. Not as if you've been you been struggling back there. God. First question, you're leaving, sir, or are you on a sponsored walk? <laughs> You what, sir? I decided to go. Decided to go. <laughs> we shall lose you. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Goodbye. Great. So, questions? Madam. Have you, thinking of the title of your books, given us any false impression? And can you tell us your best kept secret? Ah. <clears throat> titles, it's funny you mention titles. Are, I spend hours on titles. Hours. False impression, best kept secret. I mean, if, uh, Ken Follett, who's a friend, rang me and said, um, I wish I'd called one of my books Only Time Will Tell. He said, that's one of the best titles I've ever seen. 
I spend hours on them. Sometimes I get them straight away. Sometimes Cain and Abel was originally the protagonists, and then it was the brothers, and uh, then it became Cain and Abel. I was walking down the embankment, and uh, it came. So, uh, and with the latest one, which I'm writing now, Heads You Win, uh, that came through very strange circumstances. But. but have you given us any false impressions this evening? And oh, I hope not. Any best kept secrets you'd like to reveal? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Next. Sir. Oh. Our writer in the front here. Thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, you've had a tremendous amount of success as, as an author. Which of your books would you consider a failure and why? A failure. And why? I wrote a book called um, The Gospel According to Judas with a very distinguished academic from Australia who is thought to be, is thought to be the world's expert on uh, the Synoptic Gospels. I've never worked with anyone else before, ever. And, but I needed a scholar for that one because I thought the idea of the Gospel According to St. Judas would sell billions. I thought the entire Christian world would buy, and it was a complete failure. And uh, I ha this scholar was wonderful. He gave me all the facts. He gave me everything I needed. Public didn't like it at all. They just didn't, they, they thought, I thought it was such a clever idea, but no, failed completely. Completely. Um, what kind of books do you like reading? And uh, Myself. <laughs> what do I like to read? <laughs> and who's your favorite author? I don't sure I have yourself. a favorite author, uh, but I discovered recently, so here's a privilege for you. I'm about to tell you an author I discovered at the age of 70, so you can discover him now. I've actually asked how many of you have heard of him even. I've just discovered, at the age of 70, seven years ago, Stefan Zweig. Now, how many of you have read Stefan Zweig? Stefan Zweig, in 1939, was the most popular author on earth. He was the most successful author on earth. And he committed suicide because he thought Hitler was going, he was Jewish from Austria, he thought Hitler was going to win the war, and he and his wife tragically committed suicide. I would suggest you go and get a copy of Beware of Pity. It's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece of storytelling, and it's beautifully written. Beautifully written. So he's not my favorite author. I'm not sure I would describe him as my, but he's someone I've come to know recently and truly, truly admire. There's a short story writer in India called R.K. Narayan, who I think is absolutely amazing. I think Mulgoldi Days is another masterpiece. And I think H. H. Munro, Maupassant, O. Henry are the great short story writers. Dickens, in the end, is the granddaddy of them all. He's arguably the most successful author that's ever lived. He had a couple of advantages. There was no television. There was no radio. Books were about the only way you got your entertainment. And he was the best at it, let's be fair. He was the best at it and uh, did very well. But I, I still think, I think A Tale of Two Cities is wonderful storytelling. My wife thinks Bleak House is a masterpiece. So. So easily my favorite one of your novels is The uh, Prodigal Daughter. And I was wondering uh, what the genesis of that character was, and did you know uh, her story when you were writing Cain and Abel? Uh, the Prodigal Daughter, of course, the story of the first woman president of the United States. And haven't the United States taken a long time, poor things, to work out that maybe a woman could do the job better than a man? Particularly the present incumbent, dare I say it, uh, I've long wondered why the Americans have not produced a woman president. It's, it's quite beyond me. Uh, I wrote it, don't forget, at a time when I was working for Margaret Thatcher. I was actually working 
I worked with her for 11 years. And so writing a book about a startling woman when you're with one every day, and I'm married to one as well, so two startling women in my life, um, wasn't that difficult. Uh, I'm just, as I repeat, I'm just puzzled how the Americans have not selected a woman. Almost every other country on earth has. By the way, just so you get it, one fact home tonight. The first five women prime ministers in the world were all educated at Somerville College. Every one of them, Margaret Thatcher included. You. Yes. Fun fact, I'm from Somerville College. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> since we have introduced politics, um, in Matter of Honor, it was about twin brothers who were it's on... a long time ago. Go yes, on. It was, I, that's my... No, sorry, not on Matter of Honor, Sons of Fortune. Sons, Sons of Fortune, of Fortune. Uh, two brothers, different parties. Yeah, 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 but one becomes the president. Yes, yeah. but the politics was very similar. They had just moderate differences. Yes. Do you think we would ever be able to go back to such a climate in today's circumstances? No. No, I think the next president of the United States may well be a pop star may well be a singer or an actor, and I'm not joking. They may get more traction, they may get more popularity, and the problem with that is, <coughs> however much one hates politicians, if you do, someone's got to know how Congress works, someone's got to know how the Senate works, someone's got to know how these things work. You don't go to a heart surgeon. If you've got a heart attack, you go to a heart surgeon. You don't go to a pop star. I mean, it's, it's a massive problem for the United States, I think, I wouldn't be at all surprised if their next uh, president was a popular, famous person rather than a, a, a working politician. So no, it wouldn't be the same today. I couldn't write that today. That, that world has changed. Trump fooled me completely. By the way, I thought I knew something about politics and discovered quite recently I know nothing at all. I voted to remain and told all my friends that remain would win. I told them that Trump couldn't become the President of the United States. He couldn't even become candidate. 100% wrong. I told them, don't worry, he can't become President. I was wrong. I told my friends recently that the Conservative Party was going to win the election by 82 seats. Wasn't I clever? And my closest friend, one of my closest friends, Stephen Shakespeare, who runs YouGov, rang me at 5 o'clock last Thursday afternoon and said to me, Jeffrey, it's going to be a hung parliament. I said, you don't understand what's going on. You're, you're, at a, you're going to be, look such a fool tomorrow, Stefan, when it all comes out. <laughs> the Prime Minister's private poller told her at 9 o'clock she'd won by 82 seats. Stefan Shakespeare of YouGov said it'll be a hung parliament. I thought 82, so I got that 100% wrong. So if you want to ask me about politics, please do, because I am a world expert <laughs> and will answer your questions with completely the wrong answers. In fact, go exactly opposite to me, you'll be there. You said when you were writing your books how you're, you take responsibility for every single part, whether it's the, uh, the number of lines, etc. Yes, yes. In a political campaign, should the leader thus also take this full responsibility? I can't for each speak part? for Mrs. May because I've not had the privilege of working for her. I worked for two prime ministers, uh, Margaret Thatcher and John Major, and both relied on their chairman and deputy chairman to tell them what was going on. Listened very carefully indeed. Margaret never believed that she knew what was going on in Hartlepool. So if you rang her up and say, I can tell you, up here it's blooming tough, she believed it straight away. I'm not saying she was influenced by what Norman Tebbett and myself said, but she never at any time cut us out, left us out of the equation. Uh, when we were doing those campaigns, I did four of them, I would be on the phone to the Prime Minister every day for three minutes, simply to report and maybe four, if the Prime Minister had four minutes for me. Four minutes telling them what had happened in my day. I give you an example of this when it, it, you've got to be very careful what you say to a Prime Minister. Uh, she called me in and said, what do you think? I said, these are the 60 seats I'm worri worried about, Prime Minister. These are the 60 marginal seats. I want you to carry them everywhere. 
so that during the next six weeks, you only go to these 60 seats. So if you're making a major speech, I want you in these 60 seats. And she looked at the list and said, you've got Battersea on there, Geoffrey. We could never win Battersea. I said, it's all changed, Prime Minister. The young can't afford to live in Chelsea or Pimlico or that side of the river. They've all come to this side of the river and they've gone to Battersea. And Battersea has a very large group of people under the age of 30, young professionals, and we're going to win it. We've got an outstanding candidate called John Burris, and we're going to never, Geoffrey. Geoffrey will never win Battersea. I said, I promise, Prime Minister, we will win Battersea. Never, Geoffrey. And I went home. I was actually in number 10. And I turned on the television at the 6 o'clock news, and there was the Prime Minister with a man called Robin Day, who was the big interviewer. He was like Paxman of the day. And he sat opposite the Prime Minister, and he said, Prime Minister, do you think there are going to be any surprises in this election? And Margaret said, you watch Battersea, you're going to get a rip. <laughs> and what it taught me was, you've got to be so careful not to tell a Prime Minister something, because it goes into their head and into their body, and it stays with them. And if you're the person lucky enough to be doing the telling, you've got to be damn right. And I fear what's happened with Theresa May, what she's been, Theresa May has been told in the last few weeks, is come from people who weren't street fighters. They weren't out on the street. Sir. Yeah. <coughs> you're a wonderful speaker. I better come. I'm so dead. I said you're a wonderful speaker. You're very kind. Thank you, you very know much. That. Thank you. I'd like to offer you a more painful question, but you may refuse it. Mm. Do you have any notion of how to reduce the dangers of yihadism? Do I have any notion of yihadism? Yihadism. The yihadis. I'm sorry, I'm deaf. You said the danger of jihadis. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Jihadis. Well, yes. I'm deaf too, sorry. Yes. What is my attitude? Yeah, no, not your attitude. Do you have any notion of how to reduce the danger of jihadism? Gosh. Do I sense the danger, do you mean? Or are people feeling the danger? I think I would suggest there is a danger. Yes, yes, of course. I've been unfair. I've, I've been unfair to you. I have been unfair to ask that question. No, no. Now. I'm trying to see, I, I'll answer it honestly as I can, if I can 100% work out the angle you're coming at. Do you want me to ask, do I in this modern age understand the problem and, and worry about it? Is that... I expect the answer to those questions to be yes. Yeah, to both. Yes. Uh, for the, both of us. But the further question is, what do you feel could be done oh. to reduce the dangers of further attacks or further yeah. this, this enormous animosity towards the West, yeah. which is exhibited by a fraction, but nevertheless by a, an important fraction, by oh, hell of a dedicated problem. fraction. It's the biggest problem we're facing in this country at the moment. Thank you. I think the answer to the question is, you and I are old enough to know, having experienced as children, I did as a children, a war, and have watched other confrontations <coughs> and seen how prime ministers have dealt with them. There's two sides and they fight each other, probably on a distant land. It would never have crossed your mind or mine that you could buy a motor car or a van and go and kill people in the Oxford High Street by just driving down the pavement. Would never have crossed your mind, yeah. nor mine. And my problem is, in this front, we now have the Third World War, which is a war which has got nothing to do with bombs and atomic bombs and nuclear war. It's got nothing to do with it at all. Three people want to go and kill 20 people, off they go. And, and I'm not sure this isn't just the beginning. Dare one say in the privacy of this room what they might do in a football stadium if they could get in? Do I know the answer? Haven't got a clue. It's not fashionable to say it, but I'm a bit sick and tired of hearing afterwards that that person was always protesting and had been arrested three times. I think Britain has the right to say now those sort of people ought to be, if they're not English, should be sent back to their country. 
I think we've the right to say that. Not discover afterwards that they've been making bombs all the time. They've been influencing people. That, I can't remember his name, you'll tell me straight away. The hate preacher three or four years ago. I will pronounce it incorrectly, but I think you mean Chaudhary. Yeah. The Home Secretary, then Theresa May, wanted to take him to the airport herself and put him on a plane, but the law didn't allow. One of the problems of having a genuinely great democracy, genuinely great democracy, is how you deal with this problem. <coughs> I have friends in Kurdistan. Anyone here from... Well, of course, it's not really a country. I have a friends in North Iraq. And I said, well, look, you never have these bombs I inside the area of North Iraq. I said, you never have these bombs. You never have the problems we're facing. Why? He said, oh, Jeffrey, when they come to the border, we shoot them. But we can't do that. They do. They looked me in the eye and said, we've got their names. When they come to the border and say we want to come in, we shoot them. And we send the bodies back. And no more come. We can't do that. I think a modern democratic society, it's almost impossible to win. Is that where you were going, sir? Or was there some other aspect of it? Ah. Ah. That's why I wrote this book. Ah. That's why I wrote this book. Oh, I'd like to read that. Yes. Thank you. Yes, please. The answer is, the In only the answer is education. Sorry? The only answer is education. Yes. And we must educate children in schools to learn to criticize each other, to accept criticism from one another. Without fear or favor. Without getting angry. Yeah, yeah. No. And that's the way to actually cultivate a democratic attitude towards society. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, time's but that's a two-way street. Thank you very much. No, yeah, no, thank, thank you. you. Can I read this on the train on the way back? Yeah, let's try and squeeze in a few more questions. Two more questions and I'm going yeah. home because I'm... I'm yeah, so there's, promised there's my wife there. I'd be home oh, for a late dinner. Over here. So yeah, go over there first. I'll read it in the train, sir. Okay, um, so what has been your greatest challenge as a writer? That you greatest had to face challenge that you had to face as a writer, and how did you ever what? overcome challenge? Challenge. Yeah. Do you know when I wake at five thirty, I do say to myself, "Why don't I go back to sleep? <laughs> I deserve a day off. I've worked very hard." And then about quarter to six, I thought, "I've got to get up." And then at six o'clock, I think, "Can I do it again?" <laughs> and then I get to the desk, and along come the words, and. It's just wonderful. I think for every writer, it's having to write the first sentence. That's the toughest. And then if it starts flowing, <coughs> if it starts moving, you're very lucky. And then if you get a, a sentence you know people will write to you about, or a sentence that is genuinely original, it is so thrilling. There's a scene in Cain and Abel they haven't seen each other for they haven't seen each other for 30 years they've only spoken once in their life and one is coming down the street on 5th avenue and the other one's coming in the other direction and even i didn't know what was going to happen <laughs> i only knew they were walking towards each other and i wrote the sentence he raised his hat it was enough. People write to me from all over the world about that one sentence because they're sitting wondering. And in the same book, when, when Florentina comes to meet her father-in-law for the first time, comes to meet William Lau Kane, goes to his house for the first time, climbs the stairs for the first time, goes into the room for the first time, the great F. Scott Fitzgerald said, don't spend a page saying something that can devastate in a line. Quite a challenge. So she comes into the house, she climbs the stairs, she walks into the room. William Lowell Kane would have stood to greet her. 
but he couldn't. He was dead. I cried when I wrote it, and people write to me all over the world saying, now Scott Fitzgerald said, don't spend three pages <laughs> killing her, killing him. Kill him in a sentence, a sentence they'll remember. It isn't as easy, it isn't quite as easy as it sounds or looks, but when they come, and it's very, very rare, very, very rare, uh, you know, that split second, you know. So that's the right sentence. Mm. Mm. Doesn't happen that often, I wish it did. I'll end if I may, sir. Uh, we had on one final question. He's getting so boxy now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get our money, sir. Yeah. One final question. Thank you so much for being here. No. So we should end it at cricket because we started with cricket. You want what? I said we should end it with cricket because we started with cricket upstairs. So I know you said that you wanted to play for England one day. What are other dreams that well, you I am the obvious captain of the England cricket team. <laughs> <laughs> it is just a pity I can't bat, bowl or field. Otherwise, I am the <laughs> obvious captain of the England cricket team. What are other dreams that you couldn't fulfill? Oh, oh so many. I wanted to be prime minister. I wanted to captain the England cricket team. I'd like to have been a super sexy film star. <laughs> <laughs> Can I complain with 352 million books sold? I'm hardly in a position. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that'll please you or amuse you. Sachin Tendulkar said to me, when I said that was one of the most beautiful centuries I've ever seen, he said, Jeffrey, I wish I'd written Cain and Abel. Oh. <laughs> so all of us want to do something else. Whatever you achieve in life, you want to do something else. Sachin said, I'd love to be a writer. I said, I'd love to be a... <laughs> <laughs> so, let me end by thanking you very kindly for coming to hear me speak and say, uh, I hope there'll be writers in this room. I hope there'll be people who will have the courage uh, to go out and face that challenge. Uh, I've just had such a wonderful life, such a wonderful privilege. It's almost kind of unbelievable when you see people on an airplane, in a station, on a train this evening, reading your book. And it's kind of wonderful when they write. We get a thousand emails a week writing about the books. Uh, and, and my poor dear secretary comes in at 20 to 8, half past 7, 20 to 8 every morning. And it's the first two hours is dealing with that. And I remember someone once saying to me, God, you must get sick of this, Jeffrey. I said, I'd be sick of it if no one was sending an email and no one was reading my book. And to end on my Wicked Indian story, I'm driving in to Mumbai from the airport and those Wicked Indians, they get hold of your book and they pirate it within 24 hours. <laughs> I am not joking. They have your book, hardback, 20-pound copy, on the streets for $3, 24 hours later. I'm driving in to Mumbai, and there's this little boy with a pile of books, <laughs> age six, seven, taps on my window. <laughs> I wind the window down. He says, would you like the latest Jeffrey Archer? <laughs> I said, I am the latest Jeffrey <laughs> Thank you.